Welcome everybody to the LATS in our soil health workshop series. Today, um, an exciting lineup of a crop by crop lightning round focused on soil health of specific crops with amazing farmer presenters. Um, I wanna pause before we get started to offer a land acknowledgement and just a moment of thoughtfulness around the land we're farming. And um, I know I'm on unceded Abenaki territory and also just um, say it's, been a long year of not seeing everyone here, so it's nice to see your faces over the computer. Um, today's agenda, we're going to launch right into um, five, five to ten minutes of each person um, talking about the specific, specifics of their crops. If you have questions, you can post them in the chat, and um, we'll try to answer them um, verbally, and if we don't have time, um, back to you in the chat. Um, and we do have an evaluation that I will circulate afterwards. So. I think that's it. We're going to get started here. Lisa, are you audible? Yep. Great. Right. So um, my name is uh, Lisa McDougall. I run Mighty Food Farm in Shaftesbury, Vermont. And as the title says, uh, we love onions. I think onions are one of my most favorite crops to grow. I don't know if I'm very good at it, but I certainly do watching them develop in the field. Um, we're certified organic. Uh, CSA markets wholesale, like many of you. Uh, we do about 14 acres of vegetable crops, another four to five acres in cover crops. We have uh, five seasonal and then four year round crew members. Uh, it'll be my 15th year in 2021, and we're doing about a half acre of onions. Um, and that picture is of Sedona, which is from high mowing, which is one of my most favorite varieties. Have a love affair for that onion. Um, next slide. So how we grow onions, um, probably the same as a lot of you. On black plastic, two rows per bed, six inches in row, 12 to 14 inches between rows, uh, about two to three plants per hole. Uh, we don't use irrigation. We're working on getting it set up for 2021, hopefully, by doing a new well. Um, but as of right now, we do not drip our onions. We just water wheel them in. Um, we do mulch paths of some kind. Uh, this is our 2020 crop with uh, mowed pathways. Um, I'll be moving probably away from that system. I do like it quite a bit, but um, it, uh, it hurts my hands and my crew says I need to sign their paychecks so I should take better care of my hands and not mow so much. Um, so we'll be doing weed mat like a lot of folks for the 21 season. We are front loading all of our nutrients for our onions, uh, maybe an occasional application foliar of uh, nitrogen, but more likely calcium, uh, potassium or phosphorus. Um, we do yellows, sweets, minis, reds, chips, red longs, pearls, whites. Uh, we cure them in the greenhouse and then we clean them up as needed um, in the fall time on a cold morning, usually before harvest. And then we are storing them in an insulated room with a space heater through May. Pretty low key. Uh, next slide, please, Becky. Uh, what onions want, uh, like all of vegetable crops, they want all the nutrients at a certain time <laughs> at their fingertips, uh, especially onions. They're a little more shallow rooted, um, so they kind of want what they need right there, uh, especially um, in the beginning of the season when the soil is pretty cold um, and also when they're starting to go into their bulbing stage. Um, so they want a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in the beginning of the season for their vegetative growth. Um, and then once they sort of get all their green tops and then they, they transition into bulbing out um, in the middle of June or so, end of June, um, they're looking for a lot more uh, potassium and calcium. Um, when we are transplanting our onions, we're putting a good amount of fertilizer in those water wheel tanks, a 311 or a 333. Um, lack of phosphorus in the cold soils, like most, you know, veg crops earlier in the year, it's going to cause them to stunt. Um, 
So I recommend putting some fertilizer in those tanks, which you guys probably all do. Um, there's, there was, when I was doing like research for this, um, there was a lot of actually conflicting articles on saying that you should really feed your onions a lot of nitrogen when they start to bulb out. Um, and I had always thought that it was the, um, the opposite where you kind of want to starve them a little bit. Um, a lot, too much nitrogen when they are bulbing is going to delay maturation as well as perhaps affect their storage capabilities, meaning that they might spoil quicker. Um, so I'm looking going to continue to not give my onions a lot of nitrogen or just give them what they need at the beginning of the season. Um, but there was definitely some conflicting articles out there. Um, so, you know, we might do a, um, a potassium and calcium um, foliar feed if it's kind of dry, because again, we do not um, irrigate our onions. Um, Onions are also particularly sensitive to zinc, apparently. Um, so check your soil samples. Your seedlings and young plants will look deformed and twisted if there is a lack of zinc in your soil. Um, you need copper for color. They're nice skins. And your sulfur um, quantities in your soil will affect their pungency. Uh, next slide, Becky, please. Uh, this is a cool little graph, uh, bell curve from uh, Oregon State University. The one on the left shows, um, you know, that they're taking up a equal amounts of nitrogen and potassium and a good amount of calcium. Um, they're also taking up a good amount of sulfur and kind of a steady amount of um, phosphorus. Um, and it's just a reminder, and you all you folks probably know this, but one nutrient affects another nutrient's uptake. So, you know, testing your soils and being sure that your levels aren't out of whack is, um, is pretty important um, and developing a, a pretty solid fertility plan for, for your crop. Um, next slide, Becky. Thank you. Um, so this is our, this is my soil test from the fall. Um, this is my, this will be my fifth year at my new farm. Um, I was in panel for 10 years before that. So we are still working on building up our soils. You can see our phosphorus and potassium is still pretty low and we have a, a really high magnesium in our soils. Um, so for this plan, um, for our onions for this year, you can see what we're gonna need, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of phosphorus, a lot of potassium and also so um, we're actually a little bit low in copper and zinc, so we'll be um, putting down some azomite for that, um, or kelp maybe. Um, and then also too, uh, we make our own compost and buy some compost in and spread a good amount every year still. Um, so we will be putting that into our calculations. But you can see there that we need to put a good amount of um, fertility down for our onions. Um, in the 2020 crop, um, our pH was a little low, is that like uh, six or something? So I used some sunflower ash last year, which provided a lot of micros and um, and some potassium and acted as a lime. And I think the onions really liked it. So if you still need to, um, you know, put some alkaline in your in your soil, um, sunflower ash is a pretty pretty cool um, amendment that I liked. So that's our plan for fertility. Um, next slide, please, Becky. Um, onion harvest, just real quick. Um, so we cut, we've always cut tops in the fields just because it's easier to deal with in the greenhouse and there's like less matter um, for them to dry off. We cut them, you know, just above the neck. We say that we want like a little, little floppy neck on the top. If you cut them too low, you know, it's really bad. Um, and I just read Scott's uh, cool little PDF that it might help with leak moth if you've got an infestation. So that's cool. So be sure to check for that before you harvest. Um, and again, um, we're cleaning them when we, when we have time and then storing them in um, some inner crates in a room with a space heater. And yeah. our um, varieties that we love are Patterson, Sedona, and yeah. uh, Red Wing. And we do huh? 
some no chipolinis for storage too. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, next slide. Yeah, so, uh, did you get some time off this winter or are you pretty much? Hey bud, can you, mute, can you mute yourself? Oh, I'm so sorry. Cool, uh, this is my last slide. So on the left there are some great resources. Um, there was a really, I mean, it's questionable because it's from the International Potash Institute, um, but there was a lot of good uh, onion growing information there about, you know, how potassium can really increase bulb size. You know, maybe it's a little, it's a little slanted, I guess. Um, and then there's another fertilizer company that I stumbled upon, Yara.us, which was a really cool um, website where it does nutrient by nutrient deficiencies and you can like put in a crop and then it shows, you know, phosphorus, zinc, copper, boron, whatever, and then you click on the um, on the nutrient and it'll show you a picture of the deficiency um, and then you know what that nutrient does for the crop. Pretty cool, you can geek out on that for a while. Um, Pacific Northwest, uh, there's a good onion PDF on that. Um, for my fertilizer calculations for this year, which I'm crunching away at right now, Georgia State's got a cool little calculator you can plug it in, tells you what you need. They have a bunch of different fertilizers to choose from. Um, so that was pretty fun. Um, I suggest doing that if you have not already finished your fertility plans for your crops. Um, and then we all love information on onion maggot. Um, UMass always has some great information, so uh, be sure to check that out and maybe putting a row cover over your onions um, if there's a flight. Um, and that's just a cool little graph I found or picture for cation exchange capacity. Just a reminder of um, being sure to check that um, on your soil test and, you know, building your Cation exchange by keeping your pH in check, increasing organic matter, um, and that'll increase your soil's ability to hold on to nutrients and water, um, which is what we all want. So um, that's it. So thanks so much. Thanks, Lisa. Um, you had a quick question while well, I switch over to Krista. Um, uh, where did you source your sunflower ash? Oh. Seven Springs, down in Virginia. Great. Thanks, Lisa. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, Krista. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick rundown on fertility in winter greens. Um, next slide, Becky. And um, basically, you don't have to do much if you've been <laughs> growing a crop in the house all summer. That is typically if you're doing a tomatoes or cucumbers or something like that that are high fertility demanding crops. Um, there's usually enough residue in there, but I'm gonna just run through some pictures of crops throughout the winter that we've grown. And um, I can tell you that basically, if we pull out a tomato crop that looks healthy, like still vibrant green, isn't petering out at all, um, the vines look really good, we don't add any fertility before we put our winter greens in. Um, we just clean out the crop residue and um, prep the beds for um, the winter greens. And that, and that mean, and the reason we can do that is because we are really heavily um, fertilizing for those tomato and or cucumber crops or pepper crops. That's typically what we're growing in our hoop houses in the summer. And um, there, um, there usually is something left over just because we're using a mix of of both quick and slow release fertilizers. And sometimes the tomatoes, you know, don't even get to some of the stuff as it's becoming available near the end of the summer. So um, this is a uh, Yukina Savoy coming out of a house in January. Um, so this is all either seeded or transplanted crops in the fall, um, either seeded, direct seeded late September into the first few days of October or transplanted in the beginning of October. Um, and, um, the only time if we if we do have a crop or say we've built a new house and our soil tests show low fertility to start with on those fields, you know, where the house new house went in, or um, or if we have if we're pulling out a summer crop that looks um, petered out, then we will add a small amount of fertility. And we're usually aiming for somewhere between 50 and 75 pounds of N per acre. 
course, that transplant translates to a very small amount of nitrogen per bed. So we do calculations by bed. Uh, typically, you know, we're on a three and a half to four foot wide planting area in the beds. And um, if you use your standard, like hoop house size of a 96 foot house, we're we calculate a 90 foot planting length because there's usually a few feet on either end near the end wall. So um, you're really looking at just putting down, you know, somewhere between like basically like a half a pound of N per bed. It's a very small amount. Um, and that, so we use yogurt containers. We're putting everything down by hand. We're just shaking it out over the bed surface before we do our last prep. And um, we use yogurt containers because for most fertilizers, they're holding about two pounds. I mean, we will weigh out things if we feel we need to be more precise, but typically we're really kidding ourselves if we think we're being that precise. Um, and so the easiest thing is to tell the crew, okay, we need two yogurt containers of peanut meal or one yogurt container of potassium. Um, and that's, um, that's how we do the application. And uh, again, that's only if we think you know, based on the crop that's coming out from the summer, if that's showing some fertility um, issues. So um, go ahead, Becky, next slide. I'm gonna just show you a few crops. Um, most of these were grown without added fertility um, for uh, in the fall after tomatoes came out. So the one on the left, the chard, um, that's just recently, picture taken just recently, had baby pop choy growing in between, which has already been harvested out. That chard's been harvested down twice already this winter and is now on its uh, third regrowth for a last spring harvest before tomatoes go back into that house. Um, the picture on the right is baby spinach. Um, it was cut either once or twice in the fall already in somewhere in November, December, and uh, is overwintered. And this is the either the second or the third cut. I think it's for this house, it's the second cut um, that I just cut the other day. And um, I just cut a little bit with the, uh, the farmer's friend harvester there to do our CSA needs, but that house is rapidly regrowing, have not added any fertility. Um, I will say the one crop that we sometimes find needs a little bump in the spring about this time as things are thawing out and warming up is spinach. We sometimes get some yellowing out, typically when the soils are still pretty cold and saturated. So it's hard for the spinach to pull up anything that is there and available for nutrients. Um, Sometimes we find just with a little bit of weight and the warming, it, it catches up. But if it really looks like it's suffering, we will um, give it a little bit of Chilean nitrate dissolved in, and just water that in um, just to give it a little bit of some available nitrogen right away. Uh, but very low dilution, like we're putting like a half a cup to a cup in five gallons of water, um, probably closer to the half cup, pretty, trying to keep it pretty dilute just to give it a little bit of boost to get through this lag time until the soils are warm enough for it to access more of the nutrients in there. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is overwintered kale in March um, that we pick at an adolescent size, not full leaf for bunching, but uh, some more of a hand size leaf. Um, so that's overwintered just coming out of uh, sort of the low growth period of February, January, February. And again, this is like our final harvest time for these crops before we put our early tomato crops in. Next slide. This is an overwintered spinach house, uh, not this year, but I think it was last year. Um, but that's what it looked like in March and ready for harvest again. Next slide. No added fertility in that one. These are overwintered uh, Salanova types. I, I believe they're easy types, actually. Um, and um, these, these, and these, so far, all the houses I've shown you have been unheated except for the chard and the kale. Uh, we don't heat them in the winter, but they, uh, they are um, bigger houses with heat available for uh, early tomatoes. So that's why those um, uh, winter crops come out a little sooner. But this house will. Uh, these were over. These were planted actually pretty late. We did not harvest these head lettuces in the fall, but they did overwinter in this house, um, and um, we're ready for a March harvest. Uh, this was last spring. Next slide. And these were transplanted crops from a spring transplant. So some of our crops we direct seed and over and cut in the fall only. Sometimes we 
um, overwinter them, uh, especially baby spinach, sometimes mesclun crops. This would have been a house that probably came out of like mesclun from the winter that we did not try to keep going. And then we transplanted in March and by end of April are harvesting uh, full size crops out of here. A mix of head lettuces, chards, kales, it looks like for the most part, some spinach on the right. Um, and so that's it, just to give you an idea of what, um, you know, the range of winter greens that we grow. And, and you know, I, I guess I have the easiest talk here in terms of fertility, <laughs> there's really not much that they need um, unless you're already dealing with fairly deficient soils for, um, you know, if you're putting if you're putting in on a new you know a new uh, new soil that you haven't grown much in already, but if you've already loaded those soils for your summer crops, uh, chances are there's enough residual going on in there already. That's it. Awesome. Thanks, Krista. Um, I think there's one question for you. What when is that? <clears throat> sorry, when is that red Russian transplanted in the fall, and is it heated? Oh, the one that's over that was showing overwintered. Um, yeah, most of our fall transplants are going in somewhere between like October 1st and 10th. <clears throat> so we're starting them, <clears throat> excuse me, we're usually starting them late August or early September in the, in a propagation house and then transplant. Um, and also wondering how you're irrigating those beds. So a bed like the one you see here that has drip line under the plastic, uh, the ones like the baby spinach beds, those have overhead sprinkler irrigation. Most of our houses are set up with both so we can Flip flop. Well, we put the drip line in when we need it, but um, they either have headers available for drip line or we have overhead lines for sprinkles, uh, sprinklers and um, uh, the, the drop downs. I don't know. Yeah, you can kind of see one in this picture on the far left, uh, the top left corner. There's a little wobbler thing there hanging down. Um, they're all there's oh, black pipe oh. up and across the cross ties with drop downs. You can't see it completely in this house. You might be able to see it in another one. And what about rodents? Do you sorry, a, about what? Do you have a rodent control plan? Somebody's wondering. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> we have all, all the things that have been going on in the listserv with questions about that. We've tried all those things too. Um, the thing that we find really helps the most is keeping the habitat <clears throat> mowed down, cleaned up around the outside of those houses like this you know, before fall sets in. So if you really keep things mowed down, you keep, you know, pallets and totes and things away from the edges of the houses, just don't have anything there. We have a few houses where we've put down, um, way back in the past, we put down landscape fabric along the baseboards to help with weed control on the edges of the houses. Uh, but those are great bowl habitat. And um, our newer houses, we've decided not to put that in. And we just, we whack the sides of those houses all summer and keep that vegetation down and make sure it's been trimmed up in the fall. Um, that seems to help the most, but that said, yes, we still get some rodents in the houses. It's not foolproof. We use traps and tunnels and all the, you know, the little the pipes with the traps and, and such. Nice. Um, I, we don't have a ton of time. Um, there's one other question about compost or manure and salts. And then Vern's also wondering if you are steaming these houses and if that releases more nitrogen for the fall and winter crops. Yeah, you're going to find out the answer to that for us, right? Yeah, I'm working on that, Vern. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, some of these houses are, well, they're all getting steamed at some point. Um, we just don't have enough time to get to them all when we hope to. So right now, at most, they're getting steamed once a year, but sometimes we might even skip a year before we get back to a house. Um, but definitely the ones, like if we're going to do a transplant on plastic like that you saw there, we may skip steaming that one because we've got a little more weed control or we may opt to put a house um, into transplants because we haven't had a chance to steam it and it has a chickweed problem. Um, but <clears throat> if we're doing direct seeding, uh, like for baby greens, we really do try to get those houses steamed um, in the fall before we plant them, seed them. But, um, but that doesn't always happen uh, just from a time perspective. Um, so I would say right now, the cycle that they're on is at best once a year and we have found a few houses that we've been able to steam like more times so far um, that the steaming's becoming less needed. Like that we are getting a little bit ahead of the chickweed seed bank in some of those houses, but it's taken a, you know several years to get there. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't say we've won the battle by any means. There's still plenty there, but it's not quite as bad as some of those houses used to be. 
Um, there was a second part to that question. Um, someone <laughs> asked about um, using compost to manure and the salt levels in your soil. Yeah. So yeah, we try to, so we, in the past, some of those houses had had chickens in them like way back when, and we definitely saw salt issues in those houses for years and years and years. We're still, one of them is still sort of coming out of those high salt loads. Um, and we still have to manage pretty carefully for those. We've avoided using um, uh, manure-based fertilizers as mo much as we can. I think, you know, there's been a few times maybe where we were in a pinch and had to put something down at a low level, but um, mostly we're using meal-based fertilizers. So like in the spring when we're loading up for tomato fertility, we're using peanut meal or soybean meal and not um, like prayers in there. Um, and if we need some immediate release, like say for tomatoes, if you know some of that soybean and peanut meal, that those nutrients aren't gonna be available for a little while, we'll mix in a little bit of Chilean to give some of that early release that they need to you know, get going um, or in an end potassium as well. Um, so there's some readily soluble nutrients available, but, um, but the bulk of the season, they're, they're using those peanut meal or soybean meal um, along with potassium sulfate. Uh, to get the bulk of the nutrients that they need. Um, so the only time we're using um, compost is early on in the life of a house when we're uh, basically building up those soils. Um, but we find you know, that soil organic matter doesn't deplete very quickly because a lot of times we're tilling in so much residue from the, like the spring, like in the spring when the greens are getting tilled down in before tomatoes. And um, so, like when we're growing baby greens, there's just there's a ton of green residue left on those beds that we put back down into the bed or into the soil. Um, so we aren't using compost um, in that way, as, um, except early on to try to you know build up the soil and then just try to hold it there. But I think we'll find you know some of our houses have been in production now for. Um, yeah, going on 16 years, 15 years. So um, a, a couple of those actually we've rebuilt in that time. And when we did that, um, we did some cover cropping like during a, a vacant summer when we were rebuilding a house, we um, had some um, cover on the soil to, and so that helped in some ways, but that's usually not an option. If you got a house in continuous production, you're probably not cover cropping it much. Um, Awesome. Oh, yeah, we, we avoid the manure as best we can. Cool. Thanks so much, Krista. Um, Andrew, do you want to share your screen so you can share your slides? Yeah, I just threw these together last night because I was having problems getting to Becky. So we'll see what's here. Um, so I'm Andrew uh, from Clearbrook Farm in Shaftesbury. Um, we're, uh, I'm talking about brassicas and we've, uh, been growing for 25 plus years. And um, we have uh, about 25 to 30 acres in veggies every year and another 15 to 20 in various cover crops and things. Um, brassicas used to be pretty easy to grow and they've gotten a lot harder. Well, every, everything's getting harder it seems, but um, uh, mostly with disease issues. But as far as fertility, I'll just give you what we do and and uh, it's pretty basic. The, the, the last, uh, Krista and Lisa, those talks were awesome. I, I learned so much and the, the detail was really good and really helpful. I'm a little less detailed, um, but uh, what we do basically is we uh, will always try and have a cover crop, you know, whether it's, so we, well, one other thing quickly is that we have a farm stand that's 99% of our business or our winter CSA. And, um, but that farm stand, you know, we need brassicas. It's a, you know, every day. So we plant uh, some form of brassica every 10 days, mostly broccoli, cauliflower, cabbages, kale, like three or four times during the season. Um, and yeah, those are sort of our main, you know, a little bit of bok choy and napa cabbage and Brussels sprouts for sure for the fall. Um, but uh, that, that, that amount, that demand for brassicas means that we're, you know, that we're, we need a lot of land for it. 
And so we luckily have three different fields that we farm. Each is about our farm stand and our home farm is in the middle. And the three quarters of a mile in each direction, north and south, we have another 15 acre field in one direction and about a 30 acre field, 25 to 30 acre field in another direction. And so we're able to, we sort of do three sort of area, we plant brassicas in each of those fields every year, like the early season, first four or five plantings in the middle and then the, the fall brassicas. Um, so in the spring, for our spring brassicas, generally we're going into a winter killed pea and oat cover crop. And our summer brassicas, sort of the mid season ones, often just got, kind of go into a rye uh, plowed, you know, mowed and plowed down cover crop. Mm. And then the fall, when I do things correctly, uh, we have uh, overwintered hairy vetch crop that we plowed under first, and uh, that maybe been planted with some oats. And that hairy vetch, we love. That's just makes when when I when I'm on it, uh, those those brassicas always seem to do really really well. If I miss that, sometimes I'll plow uh, rye early and put in some peas and oats for before that fall. Uh, before that fall, the, all those multiple fall brassica plantings. So that's our cover crop. Then, you know, we use crares and uh, we'll put on about a ton an acre. And, uh, and um, we just spread it with this thing, mostly sometimes with the cone spreader if we're just doing a small, a small field. Um, and we use the other 543, the standard crares. And, um, and also uh, actually, and we'll also add uh, about uh, generally depending upon soil tests and stuff, 100 to 150 pounds of sulfate of potash in there with each ton of crares. And that that whole, that whole spreader we put, you can hold three, but it makes us uncomfortable. So we put two tons at a time and that's plenty for us to, you know, I don't like to spread too far ahead uh, because of the loss of nutrient by the time we get that you know, get a crop in there if we're, you know, if we're moving through a field um, and we're only planting, you know, a thousand or two thousand plant trans transplants every 10 days, let's say, by the time we get to the end of that field, it's been a few weeks. So uh, we like to put on the fertilizer within three or four weeks of planting at the latest. Um, so then we transplant, we, we love, we, we dip all our brassicas in surround. Uh, we make a little slurry. It's kind of gross, and um, everything gets covered in and um, uh, surround with uh, attached spreader stickers. The one we use right now, <clears throat> and that um, and we I don't know we we put in probably a gallon of surround into a into a flat that's about four you know big enough to dip a tray into, and uh, we put in just a an ungodly amount of attack of the spreader sticker until and then stir it like crazy and hopefully there's some um there's some ability for the surround it, it's weird it's hydrophobic but eventually we get it and when it's done right the we transplant the and the crop looks like that and it'll even survive a rain rain or two and um and it really helps with flea beetles in that early that stage and i hate putting you know i just hate remay and we use it, I just hate using it, but um, when I don't have to. So this really helps with, with reducing that as just an FYI, not so much fertility, but just general crops. And then I don't have a picture of, um, of side dressing brassicas that I could find handy. I'm sure I do somewhere, but this is the side dresser we use. It's a Lampco and um, it's out of California. And we put in, uh, each can each clamp like that that hopper will hold uh, about 300 pounds uh, to 350 pounds of crares and we mix in with that about 40 uh, about um, sorry about 35 to 40 pounds of Chilean and sometimes some sulfate of potash if um, we didn't get on the field early and we try and get those crop we try and side dress about um, uh, I'd say about three to four weeks after we transplant. And that might be a little late for the crares. You know, it, it's, it, I don't know. I'm, I haven't really experimented with, but I think, I do think it helps. I, I know it helps actually. 
but I, I don't know, maybe you could put it all front load everything and be in the same shape as side dressing, but we like side dress. Um, that's like what the crops look like. Um, maybe um, that's, I don't know, uh, what was that, about four weeks after transplants. And same with that field. <clears throat> and you can see we mix all our different crops together. You know, we, we do blocks of whatever, eight beds so that we can, we have a boom sprayer so we can spray BT, which is crucial for us. Oh, one other thing is when, um, sorry, I meant, I meant to mention um, before we transplant or after we've transplanted and they're just transplanted, we, we, we have very low boron in our fields. And uh, I definitely, this year I was really on the boron. Every, every planting of brassicas got about two pounds of boron, one and a half pounds of boron per acre with our boom sprayer. And uh, sometimes we'll get the, the bare ground where we're going to plant, you know, we, it just depends. Sometimes they spray over or transplant. But in any case, it was the first year we had very little um, hollow crown, like hollow stems. It was, and it was a really dry year in our brassicas, other than our first few plantings. And that was a whole nother fertility thing. But um, we had solid stems and things really did well this year. And so boron was really, really crucial for us. I think, I mean, I, I'm assuming uh, that, that that's what made it, uh, that's what made the crop so good. Um, so this is on August 13th of that year. I think it was 2014. Some years I have, I don't have the most up-to-date photos here and there, but, and this was five weeks later on September or four weeks later, this was September 14th, uh, the same field. And that was, you know, just using the crops, the, using the fertility with the side dressing. And uh, that had a cover that, I can't remember the cover crop. I think that one was just rye. Um, and that's, that is our, um, that's sort of a early fall. We have one more fall planting. That's, well, we have a couple more plantings, but um, anyways, that's sort of almost our, almost our late fall stuff. And, when stuff looks good, you know, we have a good crop and, and um, that's what our goal is. Broccoli has been very hard for me lately with uh, crown rot. I haven't had, late, I have luckily not had sweet midge yet, but I'm sure it's coming um, and that will change everything. But as of now, we haven't. Um, I did have a little, a mis I made a mistake this year on our Brussels sprouts and it was a really good mistake. Um, Normally one of my main guys does all the fer fertilizer spreading. And uh, this year he was away, he had to go away for a week and, and I had to spread the fertilizer for the Brussels sprouts. And somehow I didn't do it right. And for a section I had, the spreader wasn't spinning and spreading the full width. It was putting it at about 10 feet wide. The, the spinners weren't uh, engaged fully. And, um, and so I had this all this fertilizer uh, down in right where the Brussels sprouts were going and you know it was especially at one end of the field and uh, which is actually the weak end of the field but uh, well whatever we had this we planted and I did side dress a little bit our Brussels sprouts with our usual side dressing actually with Brussels sprouts we add extra potassium we probably double the potassium over the nitrogen level that's my understanding from this guy at Bijou is the right is the what you want to do with Brussels sprouts and I think potassium is a stem enhancer, so it makes sense, I guess. But in any case, that mistake, we had, I'm not, I had four and a half, five foot Brussels sprout stalks. I've never, it was just, it was crazy. And uh, I know, and I couldn't figure out what happened. And I realized it was because uh, I had screwed up and spread way too much for fertilizer in this one section of the Brussels sprout field. And uh, you know, it, it paid off. I mean, they were the nicest Brussels sprouts I've ever grown. Um, in any case. And then finally, we do some brassicas in the, in the uh, hoop house for the fall and, or for the, our winter CSA. And um, this year is the first year I really got on using the bug netting. And I, I normally have fall looper or army worm or whatever it is that, you know, just you can't seem to get rid of. And um, this year I put this port net over it or whatever it's called. And um, with some hoops and it was awesome. It really was super helpful. 
um, and we just let the crops grow under there. And our fertility in here, uh, this doesn't have tomatoes. This had, uh, I can't remember what was, I think this might have just been uh, an extra vegetable bedding plant house in the spring and nothing all summer. So I put probably a bag and a half of prayers in there. And I didn't take a soil test and we just wung it and then that's what we got. And so, and that's, that's in a 2000 square foot house. Um, so that's it. That's what I got. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andrew. That was great. Tons of amazing information. Um, I'm going to buzz along. If you feel like visiting the chat and answering those questions, that'd be great. Yep. Otherwise I can send them to you afterwards. Um, moving on to Danielle and Ben. Um, from Route 5 Farm. Thanks for organizing this, Becky. This is a very interesting um, episode. <laughs> uh, all right, so yeah, I'm here to, to speak briefly about carrots and we can move to the next slide. Um, I thought to just give you a quick overview of our soils because that influences everything about how we grow choices you should make about how you grow. So um, so yeah, we're here in the Connecticut River Valley on a very fine sandy loam and we have very low organic matter in our soils and high phosphorus. So um, we're working on building our organic matter through two-year cover crop rotations and using fertilizers with low or no phosphorus and we're, um, we've stopped using compost or manure as a method to try to reduce our phosphorus load. Um, and so in our soils, a successful crop of carrots really comes down to um, our choice of cover crop preceding the carrots. Um, and I'll get into the details of this in a second. Um, and then the timing and quality of our bed prep and irrigation. <clears throat> we don't find that carrots are really all that finicky or high maintenance in terms of soil amendments. And so we do um, two main plantings. Um, we do a summer crop that we plant in mid-May. We do about half an acre. And we do um, an early July planting of fall carrots and we do just under an acre in the fall. And I split these out just because of their the timing. Um, we treat them differently because there's different cover crops coming before them and, and sort of what's coming after them. So I separated them out for this presentation. Um, so yeah, so our summer care crop, we are typically, um, we follow it with, sorry, the carrots are following a winter squash crop from the year before. Um, and so after our winter squash crop, we get a, an oats, oats and peas, cover crop in as soon as we can by mid-September and we we plant it very densely um, so that we can get some good growth before frost and we've decided you know this sort of timing and combination of things um, because we're pretty good at keeping our squash clean of weed seed and that feels really important um, as we're going into carrots and you know keeping carrots clean of weeds is one of the biggest challenges. So we don't wanna have a big weed seed bank going into that carrot season. So <clears throat> as long as we've had a nice clean squash crop, we, we proceed with this plan. Um, and then the timing works out pretty well in terms of like establishing oats and peas in the, in the fall and then winter kill um, for an early crop of carrots. And then we also find that the nutrient balance is, is good because we're coming out of a fruit crop and going into a root crop. So it's a good rotation for balancing those nutrients. Um, and just a note that we always test our soils in the fall so we know what amendments we need for that early spring crop. So this is kind of what the oats and peas look like in the early spring once the snow has melted. Um, and so we're getting in there as soon as we can for our, in our soil, our soils dry out very quickly. So we're usually in, um, disking by early April and we let the bet that that block just kind of rest for a couple of weeks after, after we've um, turned all that material under and that breaks it down enough um, so we can come in first week in May to chisel those beds um, and and then we 
amend. We amend according to our soil tests. Um, typically it's about 50 pounds per acre. We use ProBoost um, and 150 pounds an acre of Solpol Mag takes care of our um, K needs. And then we lime as needed to make sure we reach 6.5 pH. And we're still in sort of an old school, like using yogurt containers by hand to apply our amendments. Um, we're working on uh, getting a, a tractor application, but it, what we love about the yogurt container method is that it gets us directly where the crop wants it or, you know, so right in the rows versus fertilizing the whole bed and into the wheel tracks. And um, so anyhow, that's how we're amending. Uh, so then we form our beds with a field cultivator that with bat rolling baskets on the back. We don't use a rototiller. And um, with that method, we're able to make nice, fine, fine seeded beds. Um, it's really important to have no chunks for direct seeding carrots. And then irrigation, um, we, we make sure we have our irrigation set up the day that we um, seed carrots, no matter if there's rain in the forecast or what, we don't trust it. We, we know that we need to irrigate daily until um, we see those carrots germinate. And as you know, they take quite a long time, seven to 14 days. So um, that's a really critical period of, for, for us for growing carrots. If we see poor germination, we know we're off to a terrible start. <laughs> and, um, and yes, we um, always do our best to flame before the carrots emerge for weed control. Um, yeah, and then just regular watering until carrots, the carrots size up. Um, it, it, it's sort of a common in our soils. It's like, it just helps the carrots access all those nutrients and, and um, so we, we just make sure we're, we're really consistent with our watering throughout the whole life cycle of the carrot. And weekly tractor cultivation, baskets, sweeps, finger weeders, the whole fleet. And then ideally we're only hand weeding once, um, just pulling trees that the tractor has missed. And we don't side dress carrots. Um, and then the nice thing about this summer crop of carrots is we find that there's plenty of time to establish our, our next sort of two year cycle of cover crop. Um, we can wait for some good rain and um, establish some clover. We've been doing um, like clover and oats combination or clover and Sudan grass and then mowing off the grass and letting the, clo the clover kind of fill out underneath and, and had a lot of success with that. Um, next slide. Okay, and then just quickly for the slight difference here with the fall carrots, since we're planting in early July, um, we're typically coming out of a two-year cover crop cycle and it varies depending on what block we're going into, but some, sometimes we've gone into a clover um, block and sometimes we've gone into rye vetch. And like Andrew was saying, we love vet, the vetch. Um, we always, when we do a rye vetch combination, we always go really heavy on the vetch. Um, especially for going into carrots. It's because the rye takes quite a long time to break down in and form beds after you've plowed it under. The vetch will break down a lot quicker um, and just makes better beds for the carrot seeding. And so this is kind of this, the picture is what, um, yeah, that's a rye vetch crop. It's really critical here to mow um, your cover crop kind of sooner than you really want to, at least for us, we're always, it's always like, um, it's before that, you know, before the seed head forms, um, you really want to get that, that cover crop plowed under while it's still green so that it can break down. Um, if you wait too long, it'll, you, it'll be tough to make those beds for the carrots and get them ready. Um, so that timing is really critical. And then, yeah, so by late June, we're chiseling the beds and amending, and then we harvest in October. And then this soil ends up being open all winter because of the late harvest, um, which is a bit of a bummer, but we try to take advantage of that by following it with an early spring green cro um, crop of salad greens. And so that's our carrot plan. Thanks, Danielle. Um, that's awesome. Um, 
I'm going to buzz along to Evan. And again, if you, it looks like Hillary has a question for you in the chat, if you don't mind visiting that, or I can send you questions after, but this is a along here. Evan, um, you out there? Yes, I'm out here. Great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, go ahead and you can just tell me when to move along. Great. So well, I'm going to. I'm going to do a little talk here on um, field salad greens. Um, Heidi and I, my wife and I run Small Axe Farm. It's a, a one acre no-till market farm. Um, and we do also farm on a steep slope, which you'll see in the pictures. Um, so I mostly I'm, what I'm going to do since we've had a talk on winter greens is talk about kind of what we do to grow um, salad greens in our no-till setting um, during the other three seasons. So um, this is, uh, we grow, just to let folks know in terms of baby greens, it would probably be pretty typical for folks, we grow kind of four different families, um, a brassica family greens, um, lettuce, spinach, and, and sometimes beet greens in that same family, and then Claytonia as well. So in our farm, it's pretty heavy on greens. It's probably 50% of our sales, although in, um, so we do we do a lot, and that's how we can kind of make a living on an acre. So here, this is a picture of Heidi in a field of uh, brassicas, um, getting in the middle of harvest. So um, maybe we can. Um, I, I would like you to take you through our process from the point of clearing a bed um, of the last crop to put in the next crop. And so maybe we can go to the next slide, which I think is a video. So this is a this is how we clear um, brassica beds, lettuce, even salanova, um, spinach. Um, basically, I use a weed whacker. There's a bunch of different blades you can use on it, and I'll go. You can see I go right down the bed and I weed whack right into the pathway. And before that, I've actually um, weed whack the pathway to get any weeds or anything that were growing in the pathway. And so when I'm done with this process, then I'll come do, come and do a quick rake. Um, and then we can probably go to the next slide. And at, after that, I, I've kind of skipped a step here. Um, th after that quick rake will amend if necessary. So as far as soil amendments go, um, it will definitely, Right now, with our we're using um, ProGrow, um, and that will change probably this year with our next soil test. It was just kind of working for what we needed, and so in the springtime we'll do like three pounds per forty-five foot bed, which are which are our beds um, length, which is like one and a half yogurt scoops, um, which is really works well on our scale of farming. Um, so we'll put in amendments generally early spring. Um, and it's, there are times when we'll grow, we'll take a bed and we'll grow five crops of greens, um, over the course of the summer. Um, if we're doing all brassicas in one place, sometimes we do that other times they're rotated with other crops. It just depends on, on what our plan is for that specific section. Um, to be able to grow five crops of greens in zone four, um, requires really quick turnaround. Um, and so this process that we have of, of weed whacking, using a tilther, and then we can plant right away into that. And all of the greens stay in the pathways with the dirt that came off with the weed whacking. And then we can plant that day into it. So there's no, there's no turnover be between crops and there's living roots from the last crop still in the bed when the next crop goes in. And that's kind of our, our process there of we want quick germination, quick germination and quick turnaround. Um, I'll probably go to the next slide here, Becky. So, um, in terms of and, and so in terms of nutrients, it's it's pretty as other people have talked about. We they, they, they don't require a lot. Generally, just early season, or if we're doing spinach or salanova at a time of year when we might get like three cuttings off of it, we might up our we're going to up our um, our fertility. Um, for that and spin it we grow lots of successions of green beans so typically um, I'll be planting spinach 
all summer long, but right after green beans when they come out. Um, and that's that works really well to get a little extra nitrogen for the spinach. Um, and then there are times of year where the Salanova is just not going to be as vibrant just because of the time of the year. And I don't put as much fertility to it at that point. Um, so we would kind of, if we're adding a lot of fertility, we would double that rate per that 45 foot bed and maybe go with three scoops of ProGrow or the equivalent of other fertilizer. Um, so another way we grow greens is with a paper pot transplanter. So at that same point where I was direct seeding with a Jang seeder, I might do multi, multi sown cells of paper pot um, greens. And this will help us to get an extra crop in a bed per year because it gives us that 10 day or, or two week jump start on the, on the season. Um, which is uh, really important for us. Um, we have a, we're in a fairly warm spot in some ways for zone four, but we're, we're in a high windy mountainside. Um, and so to get, we, to, to make the living in this short season, we really need to kind of push the edges of the season and the paper pot transplanter helps us with that. Um, so let's see, we can go on to the, actually, yeah, go into this slide here. So generally, after we plant, um, we, we germinate our, our green seeds if we're doing uh, mustard seeds or baby lettuce um, or spinach. Um, we'll use silage tarps the white side up in the summertime. And th what that's going to do is just help to get really fast, even germination on the beds. So that may only be on there for 48 hours for mustards when it's hot outside, or it could be in the springtime, we'll use it black side up. And if we've planted, say we somehow the snow melted off in early April, it may be black side up for two weeks to germinate those seeds um, in early April. Um, we also do use kind of going rewinding a little bit. We do use clear plastic as well. So sometimes, um, it, Becky, if you can go back to the slide with the Jang cedar, like in the corner. Yeah, so this is a bed that we prepped, you know, weed whacked, tilfed, and then because we had some weed issues in it, um, we did flash solarize for 48 hours with clear plastic. And so you can see the greens in the pathway there are kind of desiccated from being under that clear plastic for 48 hours. So this will really help it um, to set back any weeds that we're still living since we're not tilling or anything. We're just kind of removing the tops of the plants. So um, if we're worried, if there are some low growing weeds that we missed with the weed whacking, we'll do this. Or another option is to come in at this point with a flame weeder um, right after we weed whacked just to um, get any remaining weeds that were low growing. Um, so that, that's obviously weed management is super critical with baby greens. And in, um, yes, we use old greenhouse plastic for our solarizing. And so we never, we tend to never do long-term solarization. It's usually only just 48 hours, only in the summertime when it's hot enough for it to actually be effective. Other than that, we'll use a flame weeder. Okay. Um, and then once that plastic comes off, um, we will, if necessary, put on protect net. We tend to use insect netting probably for our second greens planting. Um, and then usually flea beetles, mostly for flea beetles. And usually they're not much of an issue by mid July for us. Some years we don't even use protect net. Um, if you can see these um, weed seed infected, infested unmown pastures above our fields, they're actually really great at mitigating insect um, pressure ever since we we started only mowing the our like every two years around the fields um we don't like to let them grow that close normally there's a four foot strip there um we've had a lot less insect pressure and obviously this only works for a small farm like ours where there's a lot of ed edge space but for whatever reason since we started doing that flea beetles have become much less of a problem along with pretty much every other insect i think the biodiversity around the fields um is is super helpful for just never letting populations spike um and so they're present but not to the point where they're doing major damage um let's see here yeah i think that was that was um that was the basics of what i wanted to cover and uh, kind of this is this is an example of a nice healthy uh greens bed of of brassicas um and i think 
some other things that we think about are just um, in terms of fertility are just kind of what's been in there before. And then sometimes what's going after. So sometimes I might heavily fertilize um, some greens that are, you know, they're only going to be in there for four weeks. Maybe it's a paper pot planting that's really going only going to be in the ground for four weeks. I might do extra fertility if that's early in the season and I have a heavy feeding crop going in after that. Um, because I don't have the luxury of having that open ground that I can get that fertilizer in before that I put in that heavy feeding crop. So that's, we'll, we'll sometimes do that with a greens crop and, you know, give it extra fertility so that it's there for the next crop ready to jump out of the ground. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, I, I think that's the, the basics there. And, um, I'll try to answer any questions folks have later. Thanks, Evan. That's All right. Great. I uh, learned it all in five minutes. <laughs> Grow better greens. All right, Tim, you are up next, switching over to sweet corn. Um, okay. Hello, okay. folks. It's been very, very informative, even after 40 years of farming. Um, can you see me there? Is that video up and running? Okay, cool. Yep. Um, so we're Crossroad Farm. We've been at it since about 1980. And we've grown to about 50 acres or so of vegetables with about 18 greenhouses. We, and we have two stands. And uh, I thought I'd share a little bit of, about our sweet corn production system. Um, so uh, yeah, next slide, please, Becky. Of course, we start with a soil test. And I just learned today that the amount of phosphate that uh, the way, way it's measured has changed a little bit. Um, we um, generally speaking have, uh, you know, we have two types of soil, very light sandy soil, Windsor, or a kind of more um, loamy sand, uh, Agawam. And the difference in the fertility is really quite dramatic and how we treat those soils as a result uh, is, um, is, is somewhat different. Our organic matter levels after pretty much 40 years of continuous growing um, are somewhere usually between 2.6 and 5.0 with most of the 18 soil tests or so that we do uh, coming in. We do them every uh, two to four years, depending upon um, what we, you know, what, what we feel is necessary uh, are somewhere in the 3.4 to 3.7, maybe up to four. We, have, we only have a couple of fields where it's really light that uh, are in the, in that upper two range. Um, and then our phosphate, soil generally comes back at either just slightly excessive or optimum, uh, which is sort of interesting because of some of our practices, as you'll see. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll check out the soils, soil test and uh, let's move on to soil preparation, yeah. So we start every year by subsoiling and that we replace that old subsoiler with a new one. Uh, and we break up the hard pan. And, and I think we're somewhat unusual in that we do the entire farm every year doing this. Uh, we learned a long time ago that by doing this, we just have much more even crops uh, from one end to the other. And we don't have any problems at the ends of the rows that we used to have. And just generally, even on a light sandy soil, you and as much cultivation as we do, you get quite a bit of compaction. So we usually start off by doing this, do the entire farm. And then we still use a lot of uh, heifer and horse manure. It's um, a combination because it comes from a replacement heifer farm that uh, uses, uh, goes over to Stratford and brings back the uh, horse manure bedding and mixes those two together. And uh, we have reduced our rate down to closer to a 15 ton per acre. Uh, and then we rotivate that in one time. And at that time, we don't do any fertilizer broadcasting other than the manure spreading. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, of course, corn's fairly high in nutrient requirement. Uh, and you know we're shooting, depending upon what cover crop we might be putting under, uh, we're usually shooting for somewhere between 100 and 160 pounds of nitrogen in the course of growing the crop. We do treat this crop kind of like as a green manure crop in the sense that um, we really want to keep it clean. We want to use it uh, very often as, the, uh, as a crop to lead into some other crops. We're able to actually keep this crop very clean so and weed free. So uh, it's an important crop for us. Um, of course, it's a grass, as you all know. Um, again, I mentioned the manure amount. Um, 
What we will do at the time of seeding is apply about 40 pounds of NPK with, with zinc. Uh, zinc's very important to growing corn. And then later on, we will side dress usually one time, sometimes two times around 15 to 20 pounds of nitrogen if we're doing it twice. And if, if we're only gonna do it once, then it'll be around 30 pounds um, at the time we're cultivating. And you can see in that slide there uh, that we're kind of broadcasting on the surface and then incorporating it with that disc right there. Um, and that's just a single row. We used, yeah, that, that old John Deere is still what I'm using. I, I bought that in, I think 1982 and it had just been retrofitted uh, and, and rebuilt then. <laughs> and uh, we've used it right along uh, for peas, beans and carrots. And we have a selection of plates depending upon the size of the, um, of the corn seed and the shape of the corn seed. Um, and we space it about 77 inches with 38 inches with a pop plant population around 20, well, we figure that out, 23,673. And then we go along and we cultivate. Um, we go through blind cultivating like this, uh, usually three times. Um, and we, we really love, love this Lely, this weeder, the Stein weeder. It, um, you know, you can just travel so fast and get so much done. Uh, and um, just, I don't, I don't know, it looks, looks beautiful to me. I know there's a lot of emphasis on no-till now. But when I see that, I'm pretty happy. Um, so um, we don't use any herbicides. As many of you know, we're not certified, but we've never used an herbicide on corn, which um, we're very proud of. Um, and we try to have corn looking about as clean as this. In between when we're gonna hill the corn and when we actually, uh, and, and you, the use of the tine weeder, we have these little bat wings that um, uh, I picked up after a NOFA conference way back in the early 80s that a gentleman in New Jersey was using. And they're little shovels and they'll throw a little soil up around the corn. And sometimes, well, actually, if we get behind or a little in trouble, we might go in with uh, a Reggie, a ton, you know, an in-row weeder of some kind like that. But this is what we like to see it look like. Um, uh, that's obviously two different crops, but that might be an example of when we use row cover and when we don't use row cover, we'll get that much different difference in growth uh, between the same variety of corn. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, and here's, here's what we do at about 12 inches or so. You can see the Kubota high wheel going over the corn. Uh, we actually do it in a single row. We're growing anywhere from three to four, and this year probably six to eight acres of corn. Um, and we're doing about eight crops of corn. We start off with one variety, sweetness, and then we start to add in all the other varieties. Um, uh, we'll do a, we don't do trans, we, we, we've played with transplants, but we generally find that we can do just about as good a job with a row cover. So we'll do some early row cover uh, and um, some, the same variety, say sweetness, some, some of it will be row covered, some of it won't be row covered. And then we'll move on into other varieties. We happen to right now, it's funny to over the years to watch the varieties change. Right now it's sweetness, temptress, cappuccino, uh, lure and Montauk are our principal varieties, but everything will get healed like this. When this is done, then the corn's put by and uh, it's really you know all about the irrigation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and as you all know, during tasseling and silking, uh, irrigation will be critical. And we have a, a cannon that we put out and um, it's uh, just very critical to keep that water, especially on our light sandy soil. The soil that's out back with Agawam, uh, we can get away with quite going long periods of time in the middle of the summer without irrigating. But if we don't, don't get on this, this soil, we're, we can be in trouble. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, interestingly enough, um, this was the first year that we've tried to control uh, any kind of uh, ear, uh, insect in the corn. Um, and we used only Dipel and we were, you know, extremely successful. We have a mist blower that we're using, but prior to that, we had never 
in all these years uh, sprayed our corn once. Um, and did we get worm? Yes, we did get some worms. And sometimes it would make, never made this stand here unmarketable at our little stand here um, because we just would let people know we did have worms, but uh, that seemed to work. But wholesaling it to, to other, well, restaurants generally were okay, but wholesaling it to another store or whatever, just, you know, we couldn't do that. So eventually we had to, uh, I mean, it's been a long time. We finally decided to get spraying and, and, and uh, we're having very positive results doing that now. And uh, I think there's, yeah. So cover crops, um, this is kind of the critical part to how it works for us is just literally as soon as we harvest that corn, we are tilling it back under. And that is a hundred horsepower Kubota with a rotavator and a roller behind it. And um, that is just one single pass with that. And it just takes it down, puts it right back into the soil. We follow that just right behind it, broadcasting oats, oats and peas, um, you know, maybe rye and vetch or daikon radish, whatever we might be wanting to use. Uh, a lot of it's just oats, oats and peas. Uh, we immediately do that. Then we can come back and we ground drive. We don't turn on that rotavator, but we drop that roller that you see, it's hydraulic. We can drop that and just scratch that in. And um, it creates a, a beautiful cover and very quick. And we have all that nutrient release that we get from that corn. And there's the corn. And there's my grandson, Zaf, who's now eight. And there's my daughter. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. I'm going to hand it over to Justin. Talk about sweet potatoes and potatoes, I think. So I thought everybody might get, I don't know, bored of just hearing what kind of fertilizer everybody puts down, but looks like a lot of people are doing a good job of just walking through the whole growing of the crop, which is neat to see. Um, but I'm gonna be talking a bit about how we fertilize sweet potatoes and potatoes, but then just talking about some of the machinery we use to do it because a lot of the problems it seems in our industry with over applying certain compost-based nutrients, I think is there's a pretty easy solution that actually will save everybody money over the course of a five, 10 year period. And it's just nicer fertilizer spreading equipment. Um, so before you say, oh, well, I can't afford that, like. Can we be affording to be putting down twice as much of all the amendments that we need? And I, I'd say the answer is no, because eventually it'll put us in the crosshairs from a regulatory perspective as well. Um, so we farm in a very narrow mountain valley, about 25 miles southeast of Burlington. So if you see on this picture, you now when you see green on a map, an aerial image, it either means mountains or swamps. These are definitely not swamps. Um, so it's all glacial alluvium. Our home farm is right here. And it's pretty much the first flat part of the valley. So the river flows to the north. And above us, it's a very tight, narrow, winding valley and opens up as you get north of us. And we farm over about six acres of the valley, like a little field here, a little field there that we've been able to pick up that the dairy farmers didn't really want to crop initially. Uh, we start off with very, very low mineral fertility because most of the fields we get were in um, I like to refer to as low management hay, which is basically just hay mining for decades. So it makes for a very interesting mix of grasses in the hay and it leaves soil almost devoid of mineral nutrients with re relatively high organic matter, which is really not bad from a vegetable farm standpoint. Um, and we'll get into why I say that, but it has to do with uh, cost of nitrogen relative to how much phosphorus comes along with the nitrogen, but we'll get into that momentarily. Um, so this year will be like low 20s acres of vegetables, another 10, 12 acres of full season covers, and we are certified organic. Oh, and up here, our soils not only are low in all the nutrients, they're very low in K, as a lot of sandy loams are in a temperate rainforest environment like ours. So this is a good example of a field we just started renting last year and actually sent Becky a picture of the soil test back last spring. I said, look, look how low things can be if you don't spread anything on them. Um, so for me, these fields are kind of a dream because you can fertilize this field with Jeru's, which I love Jeru's because it's so inexpensive and it's pretty consistent. Um, 
mainly it's really inexpensive, but the problem is for every two pounds of nitrogen you get, you get three pounds of phosphorus, which eventually will get you into a lot of trouble given that most crops should be fertilized, you know, five pounds of nitrogen to one pound of phosphorus as a rough rule. Um, so you can see this field had 5.2% organic matter, which I don't think that's gonna be a long-term number. We just plowed this, or no, this is the day before we plowed this long-term sod. So that number will definitely be lower next year when we test it again. Um, if you look at the fertilizer recs from UVM, most of our soil tests, if I just say, you know, mixed vegetables will have uh, a recommended soil level of, you know, 100 to 130 pounds of nitrogen, zero to 40 of phosphate, and 100 pounds of potassium. And um, for a lot of crops, like if we're just putting in spinach or kale, like this works fine. We always put the potassium higher than that. But this isn't, isn't too far off on a lot of our soils we've had for a while. I just love the way Brussels sprouts look. Um, however, certain crops like potatoes are extremely, extremely heavy feeders. Um, and um, so with potatoes, it's all about your yield gold. Um, you don't wanna just fertilize four potatoes, you wanna fertilize for how many potatoes you wanna produce. And if you're gonna just put the potatoes in, cultivate them, ignore them, mow off the weeds and harvest them in September, you can get by with less fertility, but if you're gonna to try to maximize your yield and really pay attention to them, uh, you know, we end up putting you know, more than double what UVM tells us to, especially for nitrogen and potassium. Here in the phosphate, I put an asterisk just because we never actually intentionally put phosphorus down because it comes for free, usually in excess of what we want with most of the fertilizers we are using at this point in time. <laughs> So really with the phosphate, it's what are we trying to not put down? And in crops and fields that we've had for a long time that we need to put a lot of nitrogen down, we'll buy more expensive, low phosphorus fertilizer to you know, hit that goal. But it's an amazing amount of organic amendments to get 250, 300 pounds of nitrate of nitrogen down without also loading up the phosphates. Um, so we're often doing like four different fertilizer passes over a potato field, maybe even five. So I looked at the University of Maine's recommendations for organic potatoes. And you know, like I said, 120 pounds, 25 and 140 of NPK. And we just do not get the yields we want if we fertilize like that. Um, nutrient uptake alone on a 35,000 pound per acre potato crop, which is our yield goal. We don't always hit it, but that's what we can get in a decent year on our main varieties, but the crop right there is taking up way more N, P, and K than what University of Maine is recommending. So if, it, if you didn't put it down, the plants aren't gonna be taking it up. I mean, there's some there, but not in a large capacity. Um, so for us in a typical potato uh, yield environment, this is what we'll end up putting down. And again, this is on land that we've had for a while. So the phosphorus levels aren't sky high by any means around 100, 150 ppm, like you can see, but they're in that like teens range. Once we hit 20, we really throttle it back. But what we're finding is if we start throttling it back in the teens, it doesn't really climb much above that 12 ppm level. Um, UVM Rex saying is four to seven parts per million phosphorus in a soil test being desirable, I think are kind of crazy for um, cool season vegetables. I don't know about you guys, but nothing would grow in our soils if we didn't amend if they were six PPM until about, I don't know, mid-June. So this year for potatoes, we'll be putting down a ton and a half of the new Jeru's chicken pellets, which is a four, three, two. So the nitrogen ratio is much higher in there than in their bulk compost. And we'll mix that with some Nature Safe, which is a feather meal, blood meal product. And then on top of that 400 pounds per acre of sulfate of potash and sulpomag, um, I mean, sulfate of potash and, potat and sulfamag are basically the same thing, but there's you know, a magnesium sulfate component to the, uh, the K-mag. Um, and then uh, we put that all down pre-plant and then after, usually either before the first or second hilling, we'll top dress with chili nitrate, just depending on how rainy it has been. Sometimes it's 100 pounds an acre, sometimes it's 300 pounds per acre. But again, our total applications are that what? 
280, 90, I can't quite see everything over there. But again, it's high potassium. That's kind of what we keep having to hammer in. Our yields go up when we put down more potassium. Uh, sweet potatoes, I kind of classify as a, we don't need to do anything fancy with them. We can give them their, just the, just the generic mixed vegetable um, fertilizer applications, except we give them an extra round of, of potassium. Even in higher potassium soils, all the recommendations from North Carolina State, Louisiana are all, you know, you need the extra potassium to get the um, vine growth and the root sizing up. But for us, we've done yield comparisons with different um, fertility applications and we don't get extra yield if we give them more nitrogen. Um, some people say you even get less. I haven't seen that, but it's for us, the only thing that really affects potato, sweet potato yields in a large effect is how many growing degree days we get during those summer months. Like this past summer, the sweet potatoes did great. In a cool June with lots of rain, you know, they don't quite take off as well. I'd say we're sort of at the northern end of the um, reasonable sweet potato growing region. Um, a fairly average zone 4B is where we are. Um, Okay, so sweet potatoes, nothing special with what we're using on them. Um, but again, we, we buy so many different bag products to hit different fields and have different phosphorus levels and with different crops have different nitrogen requirements. But so this year, the sweet potatoes will get um, some Crayer 726, which we like as a, that's probably the best all around fertilizer we spread because its ratios are almost ideal for most vegetables. Um, <clears throat> so 1,500 pounds of Crayer 726 and then 200 pounds each of potassium sulfate and sulpomag. But not, not crazy amounts of N there. So if we're putting sweet potatoes in a field with lower um, phosphorus levels, we will just spread Giroux's bulk compost and then put on some sulpomag and potassium sulfate over the top. Uh, so here's the list of all the different stuff we spread. I want to just put in a big plug for wood ash. I just think it's an amazing product. We're so lucky to be able to get that in northern New England. There's you know a handful of uh, wood-fired power stations, and they produce this beautiful black dust. It's very inexpensive. I've never even spread lime in any of our fields because the wood ash acts as a liming agent. <laughs> so when we take over a field or bring a new field into production, I'll put down... It's usually four, about four tons per acre of wood ash, which is a tremendous amount of potassium, which we need always. And it gets our pH up to, you know, the upper sixes. Most of the fields we take over are mid upper fives when we get them. And then you put four or five tons of wood ash on once. And then all these chicken products are very uh, acidity buffering because they're mostly layer litter. And layer chickens are fed calcium carbonate to increase the strength of their shells. So their manure is very high in calcium carbonate. So once we put the wood ash down, our fields tend to stay up in that upper sixes pH range for many years. I wish it would go down a little faster because the wood ash is such a good source of potassium. But I like it for all the micronutrients. So everything that's in the bowl of that tree, you know, is burned. The nitrogen's gone and the carbon's mostly gone, but all the micronutrients are still in there. So just a bunch of different chicken products on this list. Some nature safe fe uh, feather meal, blood meal, and then the granular potassium products and chili nitrate. <clears throat> and depending on the exact crop and how much Giroux's bulk compost we use, we can usually get our whole farm fertilizer budget in at around 500 to 600 bucks an acre. <clears throat> if we're putting potatoes on land that can't get a lot of phosphorus, you know, we can probably be hitting 1,500, 2,000 bucks an acre on those, on those acres. But across the whole farm, it's about five, 600 bucks an acre. Um, this is just my snarky plug against the manure spreader as a tool to be used on vegetable farms. Um, if you're spreading like bedding pack manure, they do a pretty good job because bedding pack manure is not really that nutrient dense. 
um, mostly phosphorus I'm talking about there. Once you compost down, you know, 10 yards of bedding pack manure, you have three yards of composts at the end. And that has the exact same amount of phosphorus as that huge load of manure did. So when you spread it with a manure spreader, um, I'm just gonna skip over this. Here's a quick drawing I did last night. So on the left here is the manure spreader, basically is a dump truck with a beater on the back and it you know dumps out chunks and big globs and spreads a little bit of fine stuff side to side. But your overall spreading width is like 10, 15 feet and it's kind of uneven within that spreading pattern. Um, on the right is a fancier fertilizer spreader, um, but you can see it actually breaks up the manure. It breaks up the compost, spreads it into a much thinner layer and breaks up the chunks. So that is, this right here is a Sittler, it's actually sold as a compost spreader. Um, but the idea with these is steep sides with a wide chain on the bottom. So it's a 30 inch wide chain. So if you put compost or wood chips or wood ash in there, they don't bridge. And then these slats are PTO driven and these spinners are PTO driven. So as that chunk right there of Drew's falls off onto these spinners, the spinners actually kind of blow it up and they spin a, a nice thin layer of compost over you know 30 to 60 feet, depending on the wet, the um, moisture level of the compost you're spreading. So we actually put a camera up here and stare down to make sure there's nothing bridging or uh, blocking the flow of compost there. But this is, you know, these are not free machines, obviously, but if you're over applying fertilizer and compost, you know, to the rate of two times per acre, you can pay for a couple thousand dollar spreader in a couple of years. And I think it's just a total worthwhile investment again to get our phosphorus levels, our phosphorus applications where they need to be. Um, this is just another type of fertilizer spreader like that, that you can rent from Laws Ag down in Brandon. Now this type of machine that has the slope side for the chain on the bottom with the spinners on the back, there's three different size classes of chain. So the narrowest chain is what you'd spread urea with on a conventional farm, eight inch wide chain. So you need pelletized material to flow through that or else it'll bridge immediately. Wet lime spreaders like this Chandler in this picture, you can see the Jeruz that's in there with a snow shovel because it does bridge occasionally. 16 inch wide chain, you can do it, but your compost better be pretty dry. Also spreads wood ash and does a pretty good job on spreading um, bulky granular fertilizers like crayers. And then our fertilizer spreader would be probably more closely called a litter spreader, which is spreading like raw chicken, com uh, chicken manure. And those are 24 inch wide or wider chain and they can get rid of pen pack manure. They can spread, we can spread crayers with ours. Cause in here you can lower this gate down to control the flow of product in and out. So at Jeru's, we drive pretty fast, spread 30 feet wide, and um, we can fit a couple acres worth in that hopper at once. And these machines can be bought in much smaller sizes than this. Um, this you could pull with a 55 horse four wheel drive tractor. So it's not out of a lot of people's reach. If you're growing, you know, if you have a one acre market garden, it's a different system, but if you, you know, if you have five, six, eight, nine acres, it's worth renting one of these machines just so you can accurately spread your expensive um, pendants. When we top dress uh, things like chili nitrate or some of the, you know, cell mag and potassium sulfate, we use a Vicon pendulum spreader, which I like a lot because this spout just swings back and forth very quickly and flings uh, product out very evenly side to side. Some of the cone spreaders with only a single spinner tend to favor one side or the other. So, and they tend to spray a lot of fertilizer on your tractor, which isn't that good from a rusting standpoint. So these Vicons, I think Tim was just, I think Tim was just selling one, but these, these are fantastic. They take a lot of abuse. I got one that looked like it went through a nuclear bombing and it still functions perfectly well. It's rusted everywhere except where it counts on the inside. Um, and just some quick thoughts on phosphorus. A lot of times we blame, the dairy farmers get a lot of blame for the phosphorus problem in the lake and it's not unfounded, but phosphorus over applications are not an intrinsic problem of dairy farming. If you don't balance the phosphorus in and the phosphorus out on your farm is when you start getting into phosphorus loading 
um, scenarios. So, you know, vegetable farms were, were, were pretty bad. We're just really small, so we don't count as much. But if we were on anything resembling the scale of the dairy industry, we would be very much in the crosshairs. So uh, that's the whole presentation. Thanks, Justin. That was great. Um, I, I need to listen to all of you again. Um, so one more, I think we're gonna go a little bit over, but um, this is being recorded. So if anyone needs to take off, um, Danielle's agreed to stay on and just, um, and fill us in on peppers, but um, there you go, Dee. All right, great. Um, this, I will keep this super short and sweet. Um, so just to share with you our experience with sweet peppers. All right, so I already talked about our soils, so we can jump right ahead. Um, we grow our sweet peppers in caterpillar tunnels. Um, they give us, they give, that gives us a little extra heat, some frost protection, not a whole lot, but just enough to make it worth it. Um, better control over watering, less nutrient le leaching from heavy rains. Um, it warms the soil quickly, so we have an earlier planting date, and it's a very low-cost structure. So we've had a lot of success with our sweet peppers over the past five years in these tunnels. Uh, next. All right, so we are prepping our pepper beds in early April. Um, we amend according to our soil tests, and we we treat these this, this space um, kind of more like we treat our high tunnel soils. So we are adding um, some compost and peat moss to bring up the organic matter. And we're using peanut meal for our nitrogen and sulfur mag to boost up the um, K. And we broad fork and BCS rototill. We lay down drip tape and landscape fabric. Um, sorry, next slide. And yeah, so this is what it looks like planting the first week of May. Um, yep. <laughs> and then, yeah, so then getting, I guess, to the, our revelation was, um, automatic timers on our drip irrigation system only cost 60 bucks. I don't know why it took us 15 years to, uh, buy a whole bunch of these things, but it was a, it was a big game changer for us last year when we installed these and, um, we, we were, it turns out underwatering our peppers quite a bit. So we used to grow waist high peppers that we were pretty proud of. And, um, and then last year we grew shoulder high peppers and really seriously, the only thing we changed was the irrigation auto timers. We set them for 15 minutes, um, in the morning and 15 minutes in the evening or sorry, the afternoon. And, um, yeah, I think before this, I, I was sort of skeptical that our peppers, well, actually all of our, the crops that we set up on auto timer, I, I felt like I was better at like reading the weather and the sun and the heat and the, and that I was sort of being a more nuanced um, waterer, but it turns out um, they just really wanted a lot more water than I was giving them. So um, yeah, so anyway, I just wanted to give a little plug for, um, sometimes it's not, it's not the, you know, the nutrients you're adding, it's, it's giving the plants that access to those nutrients by watering properly. So that's my, my lesson in peppers. <laughs> I think that's all I've got. Oh, right. And then just a final tip of, um, we grew such vigorous, you know, healthy plants that we realized um, by mid July, we reduced the irrigation to in order to force ripening because they we they just wanted to keep growing um, in vegetated in vegetation and the, the fruit was not ripening so um, as soon as we shut up, shut down the irrigation they we started ripening so um, there you go <laughs> awesome thanks Dee um, yeah. I'm gonna I I had thrown in I was a little panicked that I didn't have enough presentations last night so I threw in high tunnel tomatoes as backup but. That's not the plan. So we're gonna wrap up um, just really quickly. Um, Scott Lewins has a quick announcement here um, before we wrap up and I am gonna email everyone an evaluation and love to hear how it went. Um, so Scott, go for it. Are you seeing this uh, quick poll? Yep. Awesome. Um, thank you very much, Becky. It's like bright and sunny. I don't even see a, a, a cloud in the sky. So I'm gonna go really quickly because we're already over. Um, I just want to thank the VVBGA. Um, the research fund is supporting uh, the initiation of a disease and insect pest manage, uh, monitoring site at the Hort Farm. 
Um, the goal is to provide growers with Vermont specific information throughout the growing season uh, about important veggie and berry uh, insect pests and diseases. Um, if you have a chance, um, could you just please type your answers um, to these questions in the chat um, for both diseases and insects? Um, what regular scouting based um, recommendations would improve your ability to manage those? So what we're really interested in is what, you know, what actionable information um, could we potentially provide? Um, and yeah, our, our hope is that we could potentially replicate this in the future and other locations throughout the state um, to better align with the full geography of BBBGA members, uh, member farms. Um, and if you want more information about uh, any of our projects, uh, you can just go to this um, handy website, uh, go.uvm.edu slash pests. Um, and please uh, feel free to reach out um, at any point. And Becky, thank you very much for, for letting me tag on um, at the end. And I think maybe Lisa might even be willing to uh, share a quick survey that we had. Um, and so I'm going to, I guess, leave the answer, sorry, leave the um, questions up. And I'm going to be curious to see what your answers are in the chat. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Um, these guys are doing great work and the BVBJ is supporting um, monitoring station with the research fund. So um, yeah, after you get all the nutrients right, then the pests come in. So don't worry about that. Thank you all the farmers who share today. It's amazing. Enjoy the sunshine. Thank you all um, and have a great day. I, I'll just leave the meeting running for a few more minutes for the chat answers or any discussion questions that come up right now. You guys can yap away. <laughs>